You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Is about to tick here, listeners. We're going to see some more polls closing as I add on in here all of our next legion of uh, cohorts and special guests here joining us. By the way, we do have some some polls closing, and it looks like some numbers ticking in here in the old markets, including. Let's see here, really quickly here, as I'm adding. All of our new folks here to the show. There we go. All right. So, yeah, coming in here, we just saw, looks like we've got Indiana going for Trump. That's not exactly a surprise. That gives them 11 more votes. Looks like it's closing in. It depends, again, how, where you look. But we have right now Biden at 85, Trump at 72 in terms of 8 p.m. Central. There are some more big, big states coming off the board here and getting closed up. So we've got Arizona. With 11 electoral votes, Colorado with nine electoral votes, Kansas with six, Louisiana with eight, Michigan with 16, and then we've got Minnesota with 10, Nebraska with five, New Mexico also with five, New York, that's a big one, 29, North Dakota and South Dakota, not as big, three each, (laughs) Texas, another big one, 38, we're just talking at the top of the show, hard to believe, it's already been two hours here, but yeah, Texas is in play. For the first time since I believe we said in the mid seventies, there's about a going into today, there was about a one percent lead in the polls for Trump in Texas, which is pretty much the margin of error. So the, the last time Texas has been in play for a Dem has been quite some time. Wisconsin, our neighbors to the north here, with ten electoral votes, and Wyoming with three, with three. All right, now I am pleased to say that we have some new additions here uh, to the program. First off. We've got joining us here, Mr. Luke Rabari from Equity Armor Investments. Luke, welcome to our election night special, sir. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you on this crazy day of volatility? I am trying to read all the headlines while you guys were talking. It says uh, Trump wins North Dakota, Biden's won New York, Trump wins Louisiana. They're all coming across. Biden wins New Mexico. These are all just coming across right now. Yeah, it's interesting how the different outlets are. Some will call them. Some are being a little bit more uh, circumspect. The S&P futures reflecting that. They're back a little bit higher than they were the last time we checked in on them. They're at about 33.64. Puts them roughly 10 handles higher than where they were. So maybe the market liking a bit of certainty. Maybe the fact that uh, Trump ticking up there a little bit. Maybe giving a little bit of a lift to the market. You know, we'll give a lift to our broadcast. We are also joined by the black-hatted one himself, Mr. Dan Passarelli from Market Taker Mentoring. Mr. P, welcome to our election night special, sir. Hello, Senior Longo. I'm glad to be here. Well, we are glad to have you, sir. All right, let's go around the horn. Let's start in order. Luke, you just joined us first, so let's start with you. What is lighting up your tape over there at Equity Armor on this day of days in the market, sir? Well, um... We've been obviously reading a lot, looking at a lot, and right now in the markets, it looks like they're kind of leaning towards if Biden wins, it's good for uh, large cap value. If Trump wins, it's good for NASDAQ and growth stocks. And the way the futures have been acting and the NASDAQ's been acting, they're kind of moving 
that way. So we've seen the NASDAQ tick up a little after hours. And uh, initially we saw um, S&P moving up and, saw, and some value moving up. So I, I, it's, it's really fluid right now. But I will say this. If it's going to be close, I think S&Ps are going to sell off. Because there's going to be lawsuits. I think uh, President Trump's already filed two actions. I don't know how long. Um, I, d- I don't know how long those, those those things are going to take. But the closer it gets, and it looks like, looks like it's uncertain, the markets are going to sell off. No matter who wins, I think then uh, VIX kind of gets slammed and things calm down. But right now, it should be a little bit of a sell off. I think. Okay, and before we get to Mr. P, Mr. Shortval, I know you got things cooking over there in the land of Cape Cod. Your state's already declared, so you're, you guys are kind of done. Uh, but before you go, sir, any other nuggets or pearls of wisdom you want to leave our audience with there, sir, as you're continuing to fade vol, Mr. Shortval? Well, I, I have similar views to Andrew, although I'm not as aggressive. And I, I've basically been telling my people that I'm, uh, I'm buying puts in VIX, but I'm farther out. I'm buying March buying March puts in VIX and maybe I'll, I'll sell some front month stuff against it. But I, I see vol coming, you know, coming in and us dipping down towards 20, probably not. I wouldn't be as aggressive as Andrew, like the next two weeks or something, but I'm definitely buying March pre downside in VXX and we'll, we'll see if we can get back to like, um, you know, below 20 this year, but, uh, it's a very big honor to be on with all the, these, uh, really interesting people. So thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much. Check them out over there. Is it Vix Crush now on YouTube, correct, sir? Yes, a short vol show live. Oh, still short vol show live and also Vix Crush. All right, check them out over there on the old YouTubes. He's talking, and he will, despite the name, he will talk about buying some vol too every now and then, right, Dave? Indeed, yes. All right, so it's not all just blasting away, but if you like the dark side stuff, check them out over there at the Short Vol Show Live over there on the YouTubes. All right, let's go over to Mr. P now. He likes to buy and sell vol all day long. Mr. P, what's lighting up your tape and the tape of your mentees and clients over there at MTM, sir? Well, it's an interesting and stressful night <laughs> uh, that's not gonna, probably not likely to end for a few days, I think. Um, and just to kind of hit on a point that I think we've talked about uh, on the show here uh, before I, I jumped on, is that close is the worst outcome for the markets. Um, like, like e- and, and, and by close, like even if one of the candidates wins by a fair amount, uh, any one particular state that has a large number of electoral college votes – can be contested or, or, or a couple of them. And so, you know, like close is by far the worst outcome. Um, but we're, we're, we're going to have to see how things play out. And I, and I think it's going to be a few days. Was there any market bias one way or the other to your mentees coming into your lessons and your chats these days? Were they saying, hey, Dan, I need to buy some protection. How do I do it? I want to sell some vol. Any direction one way or the other they were leaning, sir? No, I mean, I think there was a like like a fair amount of anxiety, you know, but um, I mean, I just feel that the consensus is that when we get an established winner, it's good for the markets. And until then, it's probably not good for the markets. Well, you know, what's always good for the markets is some trade analysis. Mr. Brian, I believe you had someone bring up an interesting little uh, VIX trade in your noon webinar. You want to break it down for us, sir? Oh, I'm happy to. And uh, I want to say hello to all the new guests uh, on the show. Um, Yeah, uh, on our noon webinar, somebody actually kind of brought up uh, and we talked a lot about just how hard it is to buy puts and even be right in the VIX and uh, still get paid in that uh, right now we see the VVIX running up around 137-ish, right in that range. So you're paying a lot of premium for just by looking at the VIX of the VIX, showing you that. So we actually looked at a uh, back spread in the VIX where we're going to sell one and buy two. And uh, and I, when Mar- when uh, Andrew was on the Rock Lobster, he was talking a little bit about the 25 handle. And that was interesting because now I didn't talk to him before the show, but uh, what we discussed on my program, which is always not meant to be a recommendation with Ally Invest, we're just looking at uh, different scenarios. And that's what 
my podcast options playbook radio is all about we sold the 25 put in december 43 or i'm sorry we sold the 27 put in december 43 days out and used those proceeds to try to pay for two of the 25s and i just found that to be a real interesting if you do think like uh Andrew was saying that the market could go below 25 before the end of November. Uh, we were able to get that trade off. Uh, the midpoint when we were looking at it uh, was, it was about 80 cents. So, for example, if you bought the 27 strike call with the December 16th expiration right now, that's trading for $2.80. So if you do the, the back spread... You have a similar type downside in that you are long one more put than you are short, and you're basically putting on that same amount of risk, but you're at least selling something. In case that ball crush comes in, uh, you get some of that premium from selling that 27 strike put, which will kind of help mitigate some of the pain that's involved with it. And I just thought it was a real interesting trade that came up with one of our clients today that actually brought up that trade. And so I, I just thought I'd share it with the group tonight because I thought it was an interesting way to approach this going into the new year as far as the VIX is concerned. Thank you for that, Mr. Overby. Mr. Flowmaster, I know you have some thoughts on what we were just talking about earlier with just the evolution of VIX and that volatility slash election premium that's been priced in since the beginning of the year. And then also, if you have any thoughts on uh, Brian's strategy here, on everything else that's unfolding in the markets, I should mention right now where we are still at about a 33 double or so, 33.54 out there in the S&P. So not a huge move. Actually, just ticked off. I just refreshed. <laughs> 33.51. I'll oh, back up 33 double again. So bouncing around a little bit at that 33 double level. I think my quotes there were a little slow uh, for a second. So not a lot. Still changing the market. Still kind of holding its breath as we're seeing what's going on out there. Mr. Schwartz, sir, what's on your radar as you talk about this evolution of volatility over the years, sir? Well, I, I, I do think it's been really interesting to see the surge in VIX put interest, you know, especially over the last month, you know, maybe kind of kicked off with those gigantic one-by-twos that we saw. You know, and those were, those were targeting February and March. So, uh, you know, like Andrew said, there's, it's, it's a, uh, it is a mean reverting product, and the mean tends to be around, you know, between 15 and 20 or so. Uh, and I think it's, it's funny. Like everybody's like, well, we're going to get there. The thing is, is we haven't gotten there in the last seven or eight months. And the timing is the, is the issue. Um, so, you know, I think that, um, I do think that we'll get there, uh, probably sooner rather than later. Uh, however, you know, 45 is closer than, than 20 at this point. So I think it may be a rocky ride for uh, a month or two. Um, and one other thing I wanted to point out before I, I head off to watch many TV channels is, um, you know, SIBO listed these VIX mini futures. Uh, so, um, you know, VIX futures are not for everybody, that's for sure. But, you know, there's kind of a smaller one now, which just has a hundred multiplier instead of a thousand. And they're, they're trading nice and liquidly, like, uh, you know, at least 25,000 contracts a day in these minis. Uh, so it's something to, to keep an eye on, uh, you know, that one of the, uh, you know, I've talked to Russell Rhodes about it a few times, and you know, it's just nice to, to have a very small contract. Uh, it matches up better with you know the kinds of trades that uh, you know the the self-directed retail uh, or or kind of semi-pro community is doing. So um, that's it. It's going to be uh, it'll be interesting for a few days, I think. And uh, you know, it's great to be on with everybody, and thank you for having me, Mark. Well, we appreciate you joining us, Mr. Flowmaster. You mentioned Mr. Rhodes. I do believe he's in our chat, and he'll be joining us live a little bit later as our spectacular rolls on. But before you go, Mr. Flowmaster, any final nuggets you want to leave with our audience? Maybe one interesting takeaway. I always joke, you have the whole opera fire hose just at your disposal. It's firing at you 24-7, and you're filtering it over there at Trade Alert. Any just real surprising nuggets that came across your radar over the course of this year leading into the election. And then if folks want to kick the tires over there at Trade Alert, sir, where should they go to learn more? Sure. Well, you, if you come to TradeAlert.com, uh, you will be able to find out what we provide, which is uh, every way you could imagine to slice and dice option flow and alerts. Uh, I'll tell you, I mean, this year the the retail component is really the story. I mean, we're seeing a couple million contracts a day in the form of one lots that were not in the market 
uh, a year and a half ago. That's all new. You know, most people are, are saying that's, you know, a combination of the zero brokerage costs and work from home. That's fine. But I'll tell you what kind of surprised me this week, and I had to go back and start digging through more data, is the one lots, I, in general, I usually would leave indexes out of this whole retail um, phenomena because, you know, everybody says, oh, well, VIX and SPX, they're institutional hedging products. They're, you know, they tend to say 80% of the flow is trades in complex orders. So you can kind of tell people are rolling trades or putting on very complicated structures. And I looked at the single contract trades in SPX and it's crept up from around 20,000 contracts a day to 60,000 contracts a day uh, over the last year and a half as well. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I, it amazes me because you can't even trade SPX through uh, Robinhood. I know that. Um, so I'm trying to dig in and try to figure out if this, is, if this really is uh, retail that's, that's dipping into the index products or if it's possibly algos that have gotten down to kind of the, the, the smallest lot that you can trade um, or some mix. But th- that surprised me because I would have, I would have said, well, yeah, you know, single, you know, single stocks and ETFs, you know, retail is, is, is trading them like water. That's fine. But it's indexes have been kind of left to exist as this, um, you know, different use case that, that that's not really appropriate for. But we're seeing uh, we're seeing a lot of the, the similar behavior in um, in SPX as well. Uh, so I, I, if I can figure out more, I will I will let you know, and you can uh, you can post it on uh, the Options Insider. I appreciate that, Mr. Flowmaster. Now go stay safe. I know I'm seeing some images here. They're already putting up the bridges here around the studio in and around Chicago. So they're bracing for something tonight. Hopefully they're not doing something similar. Hopefully we don't see anything like that. In New York, so stay safe. Check him out if you want to learn more, listeners. And I know you do. Look at all those nuggets he had just in his short time here on the show. Trade Alert is the place to go. Check it out on your browser. And you're right; that has been just the the dominant story of the year. That flow of retail out there. It's been just it's been just a huge story, no matter how you cut it. In all ways, just in the volume and in the, the interesting nuggets that Henry brings, like the S. You know, you don't think of the S at all as a retail product, and yet. One lots. I, I will be curious when you do break that down, Mister Schwartz, because you know, of course algo is doing one lots. That's a very, it's a very granular algo. <laughs> but if that's the case, you know they are starting to break up large trades into smaller chunks to get things done. I don't know if they've gotten to the one lot level yet, but who knows? Maybe I'm behind on my algo updates out there. Uh, let's go back around the horn. It got so busy, I didn't even get a chance to ask you guys here. But let's start with you, Luke. The question we've been asking everybody here when they join the program. In fact, we have a poll about it right now, and I'll update our listeners on their standings in a second. But Luke, do you do you feel we're going to know who the victor is by the end of the evening, sir? No way. Not at all. Wow. Just that sincere in it. I like it. Well, yeah, they're not going to they're not going to know the um, I think I got a message from one of the uh, guys, so-called guys that we use that that would know in Pennsylvania, I think, was one of the states that they're not going to be able to count all the votes for at least a couple of days. Not even till tomorrow morning. Is that going to happen? And I'm not sure if Michigan was the other one or which one it was. But if you're not going to know Pennsylvania and Florida is tight and who knows about Ohio, there's no way you're going to know. Interesting. Same question for you, Mr. P. Do you think we will know who the victor is by the time my voice gives out this evening, sir? No, Mark, I, I think it's extremely unlikely. Um, I, you know, when we wake up tomorrow morning, I would be immensely surprised if we knew who the victor was. And if we know by the close of business tomorrow, I'd still be surprised. Well, let's see if our audience is surprised by this. We have a poll going. You guys can get out there over there at options to make your voice heard. And it seems like it's staying remarkably locked at that kind of right down the middle level here. We've got, uh, do you think... We'll know the victor by the end of the evening. Yes, definitely no, or I don't know. Yes, definitely at 46.6%, followed by no, it will take days, 44.8%. And then I don't know. That one's creeping up a little bit, so maybe some of the the, uh, uncertainty starting to infect out there at 8.6%. Let's see if we've got any new states being called. Again, this is kind of another one where... 
It depends where you're looking, what they're calling right now. According to uh, the AP and a bunch of other outlets, uh, they're showing Biden at 119, which says he has Vermont, Virginia, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Illinois, Rhode Island, Mexico, and the big prize in there outside of Illinois, New York, with its 29 electoral votes. They're calling that for Biden. I don't think that's a big leap there in any way. Trump, though, hot on his heels with 92 For Trump, they're calling Kentucky, West Virginia, South Carolina, Tennessee, Oklahoma. So far, I don't think any surprises there. Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, Indiana, North Dakota, and South Dakota, Wyoming, Nebraska, and Louisiana. So we do have a bit of a a dog-eat-dog race. If you look at some of the other outlets, they're a little bit more cautious to call. Outlets like CNN saying it's about an 80, 80 votes for Biden and 51 for Trump, so it kind of depends where you're looking. The future is still showing a bit of uncertainty out there. They're actually coming off a little bit, down to about 33.50 or so, so off about almost five handles from where they were, even though they're vacillating around quite a bit out there. Interesting stuff here as we're looking at which polls are going to be closing and which ones are coming up next. So, yeah, kind of surprising. We actually had a Matt from Orats on earlier in the show, and he kind of called it early in the night. He said, his models and things, he actually is predicting it early for Trump, which is surprising that he has a prediction so early, A, and then B, that he's going against the consensus of the polls out there, which is is kind of fascinating out there. I don't know, Luke, uh, we kind of mentioned what's been on your radar, but have you guys been putting on any, I know you na- the name is Equity Armor after all, have you guys been putting on any interesting hedges or you have clients calling you up? Same question I asked Dan, have clients been calling you up overwhelmingly looking for one direction, like hedging. What have you guys been putting on in the last week or so leading into the election, sir? Yeah, a couple of things before I answer that. Um, Democrats in Texas, or the Democratic uh, machine has said that if Texas has over 17 million voters, they think they can take Texas. And it just says that Biden looks like they're, he's ahead in Texas, which would be a game changer. And Florida's in the balance. But going back to um, going back to Equity Armor, we uh, our main business is uh, running money, obviously, in our two mutual funds. And both our mutual funds, one is a large cap fund and another is a NASDAQ. They both have a volatility overlay on them. So um, most of our clients are looking to get access to the market, but they're scared of the volatility. They want to smooth it out. So that's what we're doing. Now, things have been busy, obviously, as you guys know, the last couple of weeks. If you look at the uh, volatility products, VIX, VXX, uh, VOLQ, obviously, uh, going, giving us some good signals on the NASDAQ, etc. So that's what we're doing. And uh, some people have also just said, you know, we just want to wait to see what the what the election is going to do, and then I'll decide what I want to do for the rest of the year. Some of that might be that they want to say, all right, if Trump wins or if Biden wins, if Biden wins, what industries are going to do better? What's it going to look like? As I said, you know, some people are saying that if Biden, Biden uh, wins the election, it's going to be large cap value that's going to do well. Others saying that if Trump wins, it's still going to be tech and uh, it's going to be off to the races. So people are kind of hanging out, waiting, waiting to see what happens. And I think after, you know, 10 days after the election, after you know the results, people are going to do some estate planning, do some planning for 2021, and then you're going to see a lot of reallocation. You know, one of the talking points we've had a lot on the network over the past couple of weeks, I've mentioned it a few times here tonight, is just how aggressively – they came for all this vol. I kind of just broke it down earlier right, as you guys were getting on how much premium there was for the election at the start of the year and how it evolved throughout the year until we got where we are right now, where they kind of just sucked it all out of the market. Are you surprised, Luke, that they came for it as aggressively as they did leading into the election, almost pricing in it like it was a done deal? Well, I'll tell you what I was surprised by, and I think uh, uh, you had me on. The VIX, I thought, was... You know, I was a little surprised at how low it got with everything that was coming up. And I and, and if you look at the the low for the last three weeks was right before we're getting into the heavy end of uh, earnings, right? So um, I was just kind of surprised with all the big earnings coming and then the elections and then the European COVID lockdowns were just starting. 
I just thought it was it didn't make sense it was trading at those levels. And obviously, you know, we do run a systematic system, but we put put a little extra on because it just didn't make sense. And it seemed like a good entry point in relation to how far the market was going up. And, you know, it worked out. Um, I was surprised they didn't come for it earlier and they didn't come for it in a little bit more steady flow. I was surprised that they waited, as you said, till the last minute and just started to suck it up. But, you know. Interesting. I thought they could have come for it a little bit earlier. You know, that's kind of reminiscent of what we saw with other big volatility events like Brexit. And indeed, even uh, even 2016, they were pricing in a bit of a no-brainer until it all went kind of sideways out there. Brian, same question for you. You know, this has been an interesting talking point. It sounds like a lot of your clients over there at Ally getting in the volatility and VIX mania, sir. Are you surprised that they came for this vol as aggressively as they did right before the election, sir? No, not necessarily surprised. Um, I was kind of surprised that the VIX was staying at uh, b- below that 30 level. And we were actually seeing a, a situation where you had the spot trading below the futures in November. And eventually we got some volatility in the marketplace. We got some actual movement and that and that drove that VIX higher. Um, yeah, a lo- lot more questions about volatility across the board. And one other little tidbit that I kind of noticed today that uh, not a ton of, well, a few people were mentioning, I think, but not necessarily on the show, was to see the Russell 2000 index just kind of take a bounce off of a trend line and uh, kind of keep its momentum to the upside. Uh, We had, you you know, you're looking at this type of environment that in a day like today, there were so many more good signs about the marketplace. Uh, gold was going up overall when we looked at it. So we're worried. People seem to be worried a little bit about inflation. Saw, but we saw the ten-year go up. We saw the small caps going up in the marketplace. So those are a little bit of the outside things that I saw that a lot of our clients were kind of chatting about today. But it was just amazing how good overall the day was in so many different industries and uh, underlyings in the marketplace. Was this a pretty hot and heavy day for allies? Sounds like they were asking a lot of questions. Were they trading it up too, or were they more kind of just watching and waiting and keeping their powder dry? Like we just heard Henry say earlier, a lot of the big liquidity providers were turning off their machines for a little bit. They didn't want to get handed something funky right before the election. Was that the same case at Ally, or were they trading it up over there today, sir? Well, we did have a good volume day. I don't necessarily know where all the volume was coming in. Overall, we did have good volume. Now, I don't know if that was people selling out of their positions. I would have to basically look into that in the morning to be able to tell if we're seeing more sell sell pressure than, than buy pressure overall. But uh, we did have a big volume day, and I, I we talked to, I had just so many questions about protection, about options, uh, really focused on what can we do to try to get through this period. And there were a few that came out and, and discussed uh, just selling the portfolio, just chilling. There's too much news going on, and that news has basically pushed them out of the marketplace I'll get back in at a later date and talked about something that you and I talked about on our podcast, actually, Mark, the concept of just buying some either QQQ calls or a few SPY puts. You sold your portfolio. This wasn't a bad way to just say, well, if I'm dead wrong and the market does skyrocket after this election, this is just one way you can protect yourself just a little bit to be able to participate on the upside if I'm completely out. So those were some of the conversations that I had today. Uh, with a lot of our clients across the board. When in doubt, keep it simple, stupid. It doesn't sound that sexy, buying calls and and selling your underlying. But hey, in a market like this, something like that could give you a little bit of peace of mind. Dan, same question for you, sir. Are you surprised that they came for this election volatility as aggressively as they did? Or maybe are you like Luke, maybe surprised they didn't come for it even sooner, sir? Uh, You know, I mean, I feel like like they came for it... um, if you looked closely at the term structure of volatility, uh, the, like the, the further out expirations have been actually very high for a while. It's been very, very interesting to watch the term structure of volatility of the SPX. Um, right now, the the one day expiry volatility is thirty seven and a half percent. 
The November 6th is 37.8%, which to me indicates we're not going to have anything figured out in, uh, by November 6th, or, or at least that's what the market believes, um, which is, you know, uh, significant to look at. November 9th, November 11th, we're still at 32%. November 13th, we're still at 31%. November 16th, November 18th, we're still at 29%. November 20th, still. So, I mean, volatility volatility has been priced in for a while in these further out expirations, and, it, and it's still pretty priced in. I mean, I don't know. Like, the market consensus is that – we're probably not going to have any answers for a few days, at least. Certainly seems that way. Mr. Overby has to go back to give answers to his clients over there at Ally Land. Mr. Overby, before you go, you want to leave our audience with any nuggets, any pearls of wisdom here on this electoral days of days, sir? Well, you know, we've been talking about the election so much. We still have the pandemic going on. We still have COVID. We don't have a solution for it. Um, one thing to think about, as opposed to just buying uh, the, the pumped up volatility option contracts, what industries will benefit when, uh, when slash if we come up with a vaccine? And maybe that's one way to play long volatility, if you will, and just look for those industries and maybe buy some out-of-the-money calls like we were talking about, just going out in time. So with that last little tidbit, I guess I'm going to say thank you to everybody here, and I, I really did appreciate it, and I will be listening as I have the TV on in the background and getting that good information from, in, in, uh, from, your sh from our show today on Options Insider. Thanks for inviting me, everyone. There you go. Thank you for that, Mr. Overby. You know where to check him out, Ally Invest is the place to go if you want to sling some options, maybe join his daily webinar. Find him over there on the Twitters as well, at Brian Overby, O-V-E-R-B-Y, is the place to go to find him there as well. And you can get him every week on this network, good old Options Playbook Radio. Usually hits on Wednesday evening, sometimes Thursday morning, sometime in that range. You can get all that good stuff there for you. Speaking of good stuff, we have more of it in store for you here we don't have any new polls closing yet they don't close again until 9 p.m now central still some big ones coming up uh, but a lot of big ones came off the board in terms of closing at eight o'clock let's just see if they've updated any of these standings here no it seems like pretty much the same here since our last our last go around, let's check the S&P really quickly here as well. S&P futures a little bit shy of 33 half, about 33.45. So, again, maybe some of that uncertainty we were talking earlier in the special. They were roughly 40 handles higher. So, uh, giving up a little bit of that upside. Dan Gramzo was talking about how that 3,400 is a bit of a ceiling there, a bit of a resistance. So, we'll see if that maintains throughout the special. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.